No. So, tonight we're going to talk about the Arab Spring. What do you know about the Arab Spring so far? Nothing? Okay. Anything? News? Nothing? Alright. So, that should be fairly enlightening. This is modern history. This has happened since 2010. So this is not even, you know, before you were old enough to understand it or anything, not like the Gulf Wars. This is currently happening in the Middle East. So it's, um, it's quite profound and something that you know, the, the, the world is going to have to deal with probably for the next 30, 40 years. We'll see how wide-ranging the impact is going to be. So, what is the Arab Spring? And the Arab Spring began in 2010, in the spring, that's kind of why it became that, uh, known as that, and it's still happening today. There was a pro-democratic protesters across all North Africa and the Middle East that rose up against these dictatorial regimes. So, after World War II, in the establishment of an independent Middle East, and in the culture of the Cold War, you had people who came to power and were supported both by the United States and by Russia, or the USSR, during the Cold War, that they came to power not because they were elected, not because they were the best for the job, but because they were probably warlords, some of the military people who garnered the, the support of one of the two world powers and became part of their sphere of influence. Because in Cold War times, it was, whose side are you on? Are you pro-Russia? Are you pro-United States? So that's where a lot of these come, the power. Then you have the end of the Cold War, and you have a new geopolitical structure where there's only one world power, which is the United States, but then you have these regional issues in which the United States and Europe and all play trying to uh, bring stability and peace, but not necessarily the same standard of which we understand. So as you're going to see, most of North Africa has had a history of, in, in post-World War I and post-World War II, rule of oppressive governments that most usually are born out of the military, and you have people that are rising up and wanting more than just a stable government. Now, this has become even worse and, 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 and has grown due to the expanse of the internet. The problem is, is that they can see as easily as we can see the current condition of the world. So when they go online and they see people in the United States using Twitter and Facebook and saying whatever they want to say, doing whatever they want to do, and they look around and go, well, why can't we? And when they try and they are oppressed by a very systematic, dictatorial, totalitarian style of uh, governance, they have reacted to it. It's a very young movement. It's a movement in which people in, in the Middle East want democratic rule or they want self-rule, but the problem is, is they don't have a history for it. And in not having a history for it, it's hard for them to, you know, once you overthrow the dictator, it's hard to understand what to do next. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about. All right, so these are the countries of the Middle East that have been impacted to a certain degree uh, by the Arab Spring. Um, you notice the colors, again, all this is in Blackboard, so you can see the actual PowerPoint. There are some very stable countries. You see that Israel is a stable country, relatively stable. Saudi Arabia, stable. Oman. Now, what's interesting is that even Turkey is stable, okay? But what's interesting about this is that even though you have these that are stable, they're not all democracies. Turkey is a democracy. At the same time, most recently, with this current president, it's overturned many of the constitutional regulations, and so it has become very authoritarian, even though technically it's still a democracy, but it's still politically stable. They're not seeing a lot of revolt or, or revolution there. Israel is obviously a democracy. 
Okay, it has a prime minister and a president, actually, and elected officials, and so it is a stable democracy. Saudi Arabia is a monarch. It's a monarchy. It's not a democracy. So just because you're a democracy doesn't mean you're stable. Just because you're not a democracy doesn't mean you're unstable. Okay? So <clears throat> what you really see is that some of these countries have stable economies, and because you have a stable economy and a little bit of an idea of shared wealth, that those countries are not in as much disarray as others. So when you look at the other countries, Morocco, um, Sudan, Egypt, these countries, Iran, these countries have very authoritarian governments in which there's a great wealth gap between the uh, highest uh, ruling class and the lowest poor class. So you'll see that the they go from being experiencing relatively political calm to moderate political instability to significant political instability. Now, since then, Egypt has been completely overthrown, but because they respect their military, we'll get this a little bit later tonight, it's still stable. <clears throat> they overthrew their, their president, but it's still stable. Um, Libya and Algeria, it's a mess, absolutely mess once they overthrew their dictatorial governments. We, we all know about Afghanistan and, uh, and, and Pakistan, both of which are very unstable. Iraq is unstable. Syria is unstable. So you see the countries that are very unstable, and it's due to either a current government that's in power that um, is fighting a civil war, or a post-dictatorial um, <clears throat> regime in uh, a, a new age of trying to find itself and, and become um, a functioning democracy or a new functioning government, period. Okay? So we're going to talk about those things. Where did it start? Um, how did it start? In 2010, in Tunisia, there was a, a street vendor named Mohammed and uh, Bazizi, and he basically set himself on fire because these police tried to come in and confiscate his cart, and because of the economic condition at the time, even though the, the cart that he had was not a certified government or, you know, issue or sanctioned uh, vendor, it was his only way of making money. He was just trying to do the best he could. Now, in the United States, if you want to do the best you can, you should do the best you can, as long as you're breaking the laws. Now, but the laws here are, for the most part, equal and just. There, they say you can't sell your vegetables unless you have a government-issued stamp or certificate. Now, we think, well, it can't be so bad. I mean, you can't go to you know, the local uh, Publix and get a sandwich, you know, unless you have that number that says it's a clean place to eat. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is if you don't have enough money to bribe the local officials so they'll give you the paperwork that you need, you can't sell your vegetables. So I want you to give me 10% of what you're going to sell so you can sell you, so I'm making money off of you kind of idea, right? You can't take the standard of living, which you all understand, everyone who's part of this class or, or is in the United States, and say, well, that's the same everywhere else. It's not. Uh, I was uh, in a meeting this afternoon, and one person was talking about the, an inconvenience that they had. There was some road work on her road, and <clears throat> it's made it so you can't go one way. You have to turn around and go all the way around like the block and go a different way to get to Publix. That's what we call a first world problem. Because she doesn't have to, and she said it. I'm not getting on to her or making fun of her. She's the one that said, you know, I realize that that's a first world problem. What I mean by that is a first world problem is what we call an inconvenience. A third world problem is I have to walk five miles to a mud infested water hole with a jug and carry that water back to my family on top of my head just so we can have a little water and it's not clean. That's a third world problem. Okay, so when we talk about this guy who sets himself on fire because they confiscate his car, he wasn't selling bad vegetables. He was just trying to make a living, and he lives in an oppressive place, and he just got on the wrong side of the oppression. He said, you know, I just can't take it anymore, and so he makes himself a political statement, and he sets himself on fire. If you go to uh, the actual um, PowerPoint, you can click on this link, and you can actually see the news report of this happening if that link's still alive because it was 2010 time. So this graphic or this this political cartoon kind of shows the roller coaster of the Arab Spring and revolution. 
Um, these are the, the main players in the Middle East that are dealing with um, the upheaval, some of which aren't in power anymore. Um, you, know, you have Algeria, he's no longer in power. Syria, he's holding on just because Russia is supporting him. Um, Iran, this guy's no longer there, and it's uh, now a, a new president, but they're really run by the, the clerics. Um, Yemen, he's been overthrown. Morocco's still there. Libya, he's dead. He's been overthrown. Muammar Gaddafi. Um, Bahrain is uh, under siege. Egypt, he's been overthrown, and now you have the military in, in charge. The same thing in Tunisia. So you have all these countries that are dealing with this this roller coaster they've been on. The roller coaster of I'm in charge and you're in, you're not, and so we're always trying to crack down and keep you under control. But underneath that roller coaster, the ground has shifted. And no longer do they have this stable control of their country. Okay, so you see all these countries that are having to deal with this. Okay, <clears throat> so it starts in Tunisia, and this is where Tunisia is, kind of the beginning of the Arab Spring. In Tunisia, you had a, a president, okay, but he's been in power for 24 years. That's not normal for a president, okay? Now, that doesn't mean presidents have to be eight years. We have had presidents for longer than eight years. What president did we have for longer than eight years? The one, one, President Roosevelt. Okay, um, and we only have eight-year terms now because of him. He got elected to four terms, died in his fourth term. Okay, but um, typically presidencies have limited terms because presidencies can quickly become dictatorships. Okay. Every time you you hear us talk tonight about a president, it's really not a president; it's a dictator. Okay? They just call themselves president because it makes them feel good about being the president. But really, they're just they, they, you could take president out and call him a military you know, dictator or just a totalitarian leader. Okay? So he is now in exile. <clears throat> this is where the country, this is the country where the Arab Spring began. Again, you saw the picture of the vendor. In October of 2011, you had moderate Islamic uh, party called Inhada. That came to power. There were also 80 other uh, um, political parties that came to power. What you will typically see in the Arab Spring is that even though you have countries that have elections and presidents, of course they keep getting reelected because they own the ballot box basically, and you'll see that they typically have secret police or political police. And so you can't be a political party unless you are sanctioned by the government. Well, the government is run by the party which is in power and so you can't be sanctioned to be an opposition party. So there's no political freedom. Even though there's a political process, there's only one party that exists. Okay, so that's a lot of where this revolution comes from because you have this younger group that is tired of being oppressed, tired of these old guys who've been in power for 20 plus years, 30 years, and they actually want a part of making decisions or just not being told what to do. Some of it just comes into, there's no youth society. Our country and the others that wants to be told what to do. You guys don't want to be told what to do, okay? But even though you don't want to be told what to do, you're not being forced to do certain things. So because you're allowed a certain amount of freedom in our country, you're not like angry and want to throw over the, the government in the United States because no one can really tell you what to do. You don't have to be in college. You can be allowed if you want to. Would be good. It's good. No one's forcing you to do any one different thing. You make just as much money, you know, uh, being a plumber as you do a professor if you have that skill. So there's lots of opportunity for you as a youth. The problem in these countries is there isn't. Okay. So when you get a lot of angry young people, that turns out to be a bad thing. Okay. And you have a lot of people who are just fine with the status quo, with all the money being with the party and the one president and his group and his cronies and no really social change. So some of this is a, a rehash. Again, he has been in power for a long time. There were protests uh, against poverty and justice, very much so greed, okay? And again, corruptness, political corruptness, governmental, like institutional corruptness is the number one cause of revolution. Now, <clears throat> that is not to say that there's not corruption in first world countries. There is plenty of corruption in Europe, plenty of corruption in the United States, but the corruption that occurs in, say, the United States or in Europe 
it kind of plays by a certain set of rules. And the rules are, if you have the money, you make the rules. But here's the thing. The rules don't keep you from making money. So if you're able to make money in the United States and gain power and influence, then you can make more money. And it's not designated on whether you're a Republican or Democrat, or if your power, if your uh, political party is in power. So even though it's, you know, I, I love the United States and it's a great country, and and, and the countries in Europe all have the, the same kind of uh, basic principles that even we have. The idea of corruption is, is that. It's like water. People are going to take the path of least resistance. And if I have lots of power and influence and money, I can get things done a lot easier than someone who doesn't. That's just human nature. The difference between that and what we're talking about here is that the power and the political corruption and the greed is gets you to the point where you're the only one that can get anything done. You can't rise up and make yourself a self-made millionaire. Okay? And it's just rare in those countries because it's so institutionalized and it's so who do you know that the wealth is in like less than 1% and the vast majority of poverty and the living standards of the average is so much lower. You have less political unrest in our country because the average living, the average status of, of living is exponentially higher than the rest of the world. So, the worst thing that could happen to the three of you guys are sitting here is something could happen to your cell phone. Right? Like, that goes away, and it's like the worst thing that could ever happen. Okay? But you still have food, it's money, roof over your head, you go home, you're going to be like in air conditioning. Right? The worst thing that can happen to someone in Africa, North Africa, as, we, as it relates to our studies tonight, is that you don't know if tomorrow you're going to be killed because you're not in the political party that's in power, and they may decide that you're a political dissident, or you support someone that's not in power, and we decide to kill you or your family, or we just cut off one of your hands because you'll be a, a, a an example. We don't want you to rise or try to run for office or something. You see the difference in those problems? So the standard of living in countries like the, like the United States or those in Europe the reason you don't see the revolution that you see across the Arab Spring is because the standard of living is high enough that I might get upset. I might occupy Wall Street for a couple weeks, even though I might not know why I'm occupying Wall Street, but I'm going to occupy it. Okay, But in the end, when I'm tired of making my little protest, I'm still going to go home to my air-conditioned life and... and uh, my car and my cell phone, and maybe my college education, and life's still pretty good. Okay, you're, you're dealing with desperate people here in Middle Middle East. So that's why I'm trying to, to frame this. It's not the same kind of thing that you might see, you know, when Trump got elected, you know, and there were those, you know, or the things you see every day with Antifa. It's, like, it's not the same. That's a minority group, like one percent that are that are very upset. This is not one percent. This is like the vast majority of the people. Okay? You have 1% controlling everything and having all the wealth. So, he was forced out of power. He is in exile in Saudi Arabia currently. He was uh, uh, um, held in, in, uh, in a court for crimes and was sentenced in absentia, meaning he wasn't there. He was absent. So if he ever goes back, he's got to spend 35 years in prison. Um, again, what you will see if you look at, at the rest of this is basically the reforms that come about to try to bring about a little bit of political um, uh, equality. The problem, though, that we're going to start to see tonight in these countries is that this guy's bad. He's bad, but it's stable. Now he's gone. And so when you read here, yeah, the in, in how the party comes into power, but so do 80 other political parties. And in high has 41% of the vote. Is that a majority? Got to have 51. Remember, 100%? Got to have at least 51. So even they don't have total control. Remember what I said about Winston Churchill? 
Democracy only works when there is. The reason American democracy works so well is because there's only two parties. I'm not saying that's always a good thing. I'm a Republican. I have voted for both. I vote on issues. And sometimes the two-party system stinks when either party really didn't know what they're, you know, they're not, not doing a good job. Okay? So, but two parties makes things stable. Why? Because one's going to be in power and one's not. When you have 80 parties and the biggest party has 41%, and this is some of the problems with other democracies around the world. So you have to then have coalitions. Well, my party has to talk to his party and your party, and if we three agree enough, then we get to form a government. Now, you don't really trust me, but you trust me more than you trust him. Okay? But then I do something to make you mad, and you go over there to him, and all of a sudden he's got 51% because you're the swing party. Okay? It makes it very hard to govern. Not hard to govern when you have a dictator. It's simple and it's stable. It's not fair, but it's simple and stable. And this is the problem that we're going to see that's recurring in the Arab Spring, is that yes, you have these people who are rising up for their rights and they want freedom and they want democracy, but then it's like, how do we make this operate? Because we can't get anyone to agree to anything. It's not as easy as it looks. We take it for granted. This is a, again, a political uh, cartoon that shows the guy burning. This is, you know, the son of Tunisia, and, and it's like the beginning of the Arab Spring. He is the catalyst for these changes, okay? So then you have Jordan. Jordan is a great case, okay? Jordan is an absolute great case. So, <clears throat> it is a dictator, or it's not a dictator, it's a monarchy, okay? There's a king, King Abdullah II. He's been in power since 1999. Why? Because that's when his dad gave him power. Either he died Okay, so he came into power in 1999. Now, protesters have been demanding better employment prospects and cut in food costs and fuel costs. Jordan does not have a thriving economy. There's not much there. It does not have a lot of oil. It does not have a great thriving economy. So it doesn't matter if King Abdullah II is in power or if they elect a president. You can't make something out of nothing. But their concern is valid. I need food and I need fuel. Fuel to heat and cool my house and put it in my car. Okay? So he's trying to bring about change. He replaced his prime minister. There is someone in in uh, um, in Jordan that is elected to become prime minister, and so he's changing changing his cabinet to try to make things better. And he also said, and I will give up my power. Someday. He hasn't said when. So, we're going to talk about some of the problems here. So, unrest has simmered since January of 11. Okay? Um, protesters have clashed with security forces. They killed one man. Um, the country has seen nothing like the deadly violence in Syria and Egypt. It's not been as bad as what's happened in Syria and Egypt. Protesters have demanded electoral reform, and they want to see a prime minister directly elected and granted more powers. So currently, the prime minister is selected by the king. Okay, They want him directly elected by the people, which will make it more like a, a constitutional monarchy like England. You know, They're just figurehead. The Queen of England, just figurehead. And the, the prime minister is elected. That's what they want. Well, he has not allowed that to happen yet, but he did replace his prime minister. And he's brought together a new cabinet. And a speech that marked the 12th anniversary of his rule, the king also promised to give up his power to appoint prime ministers and cabinet, but has not followed through as of yet. A, uh, a powerful Islamic oppositional group called the Islamic Action Front has called for the dissolution of, of parliament um, and has criticized the king's efforts at reform. So they want his government to be dissolved and they want the king to abdicate. Here's the problem. Jordan is a small country with few natural resources, so its economy is limited. But here's another thing. It's also played a pivotal role in the balance of power in the Middle East. It's one of two nations that recognizes Israel. It's 
So what does that make Jordan to us? We like them. If they're willing to say Israel is a good country and is a country, then we don't want King Abel to go anywhere. Even though his own people want reforms. And he's not a bad king. He really wants to do the right thing. Compared to others, he does not. Re- I mean, he really wants to do what's right. But again, you cannot make something out of nothing. So he, it's a kind of a catch-22. If he were overthrown and this Islamic group were to come into power, do you think the Islamic Action Front is going to say, I'm glad we're in power and we're still going to be pro-Israel? No, they're not going to be pro-Israel. So that might shift the balance of power in the Middle East. So what are we going to do? We're going to tell the king, listen, king, I know you said you'd, you'd like give up your powers, but how about not right now? We'll support you as long as you need to. Just, just stay in power. So it's not as easy as it seems. Still in the political cartoon. This is the, the broom of revolution sweeping through the Middle East. Uh, this is... Um, Libya, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, okay, and Assad in Syria. Okay, so you have these bad guys that are getting swept out. So Egypt. Egypt has in, been in control of Hosni Mubarak for 30 years. Again, President Hosni Mubarak for 30 years. Okay, it's a long time to be president. Okay, might as well be king, might as well be a dictator. Okay, he left office after 18 days straight of protest in the capital. He has been put on trial, accused of ordering the killings of protesters, which he did, and he has been suffering poor health. I believe he has passed away. The positive for Egypt is is the one group that everybody respects is the military. So when the military came to power, it didn't completely break down into civil war. Um, But again, Mubarak was overthrown. You then since had an election, and you had uh, the Muslim Brotherhood that was put into power. Uh, they were overthrown, and so now the military is in power, and they're trying to bring stability without being overly authoritarian. So the question really has been, how does Egypt go from a dictatorial power to a democratic power? It is not an easy step. The idea is great. Let's overthrow the people that control us. But when you get to the point of governance, it's not that easy. Egypt today is led by the military directly. Okay? There's been a new parliament. It's been put together, and they had elections in 2012. After that election, you had the Muslim Brotherhood that came to power, and they tried to politically stamp out their their uh, the party that objected against them and so then the military had to come back into power and overthrow the Muslim Brotherhood. It's been a mess. Luckily, again, the military has been a point of stability for Egypt. The problem is is the longer the military stays in power, the more likely they are to stay in power. The military's not elected. So that can be a problem. Okay? So this is another politi- political cartoon. Egypt was kind of first. And you see the nervousness in the next. This is Muammar Gaddafi, which he has been overthrown. Syria has not, because uh, Assad has the support of Russia. But you can see the angst in their faces. This guy knows that he has treated his people very badly, and he can basically only stay in control because he owns the military. And so when he sees Egypt, which is a fairly stable country, overthrow their president, he starts to get very nervous. It's the idea of that political cartoon. Libya. And this one has uh, an impact on us because what happened in Libya? You may know what happened in Libya. Hillary Clinton had to talk about it a whole lot. Oh, Benghazi. Benghazi. Exactly. Now, Benghazi might not have happened if Libya was still under control of Muammar Gaddafi. Bad guy. This is like the Arab Hitler. He's a bad, bad guy. So I am not saying he's good. The problem, though, is, again, a you can have a bad, stable government 
or a good, unstable government. And so what happened in Libya at the time was created by the instability that happened during the Arab Spring after Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown. So bad things happen even though this bad guy is gone. Because, again, when you live in a society that's grown up knowing only authoritative power, when that power is gone, you feel empowered to do whatever you want. And then it turns into the wild, wild west. Biggest guy in the room, right? So, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi was in power for 40 years. Okay? He was ousted when rebels took the capital of Tripoli in 2012. And okay? after eight months of civil war, natives helped. Gaddafi was captured. We actually, during the Obama administration, went in and helped through NATO to overthrow Libya. Again, I'm not saying Obama's doing something bad. Does this guy need to go? Absolutely. But the problem was, what do you do afterwards? Now, I can't tell you how bad this guy is. Like, raping women, doing horrible things. I mean, this guy is like, next to Hitler, he's pretty bad. Okay? So, he got his just deserved. He needed to be overthrown. But the problem is, once he was overthrown, you had this National Transition Council, the NTC, that comes into power, but they really don't have control of their country as Momar had. Why did Momar have such great control? Very simple. It's not voluntary. It's out of straight fear. If you cross Momar or Qaddafi in his own country, he'll kill you. He's a military dictator. You don't, I mean, he doesn't like what you're wearing. Show this guy to the dungeon. Pull his fingernails out. Have him killed. He's got a pretty wife. Have him killed. Send her to my bedroom. I mean, that's the way this guy was. That bad. Okay. So, you know, he was a he was a madman, a lunatic. Um, but again, fear breeds stability. If I don't feel like I can overthrow you, I'm going to do whatever you say. North Korea got to be one of the worst places in the world to live. You would think they'd just rise up and say, listen, you got a weird haircut and you were mean to everybody. we got to get rid of you. They don't do that because the ones that are holding the guns are the military and he's got control of the military. Fear. Okay? So, fear brings stability. Alright, so the uprising began in mid-February. Um, it was inspired by the revolutions in Tunisia. And in Egypt, hundreds came out uh, in the streets of several towns demanding the end to his rule. Again, the Arab Spring also pertains to the, the either spring like to spring forward, but also the spring, the new birth, the rebirth. There were a lot of people who saw what was happening in Tunisia and in Egypt and thought, this is great. All of these are going to turn into these great democratic countries. And, and, and Libya was just the next one. And who better than to overthrow than Colonel Gaddafi? He's been a thorn in our side for decades. Problem is, is once things got in, you know overthrown, it's it's the governing part that's a problem. Okay. Once he was overthrown, thousands of people came out and were just very very happy that he was overthrown. Again, you see Gaddafi. He was known as a military guy. You see the people who, you know, look somewhat poor and, and, you know, upset, pushing him over. And he's, uh-oh. Well, he had lived and terrorized, purely terrorized his own people for 40 years, and it finally caught up with him. Okay? After four decades of power, Gaddafi and his family went on the run on October 31st. The former leader was captured and killed on the outskirts of Sarit. Okay? Three weeks later, his son... And Libya's intelligence chief were also captured trying to flee the country. Thousands of people were killed. Many more have been injured in the conflict. Okay? Again, the problem is it's similar to that of what happened in Iraq. When uh, Saddam Hussein was overthrown, let's say you work for Muammar Gaddafi and you're doing his bidding. Why are you doing it? Because you don't want to be killed. And Muammar's only want money. He's paying your salary. And you tell him. His kid and his wife, and you've done all these bad things, and all of a sudden, I'm no more, I'm gone. 
What do these two guys want? You. <laughs> Absolutely. And so what ends up happening in these totalitarian uh, uh, governments is that you have the, the, the head is cut off. And everybody who worked for it, like all the Baathists that worked for Saddam Hussein in Iraq, the problem with that is they said, all you have to go home. It's the entire government structure, the entire military, go home, powerless. A lot of them ended up in ISIS. A lot of them ended up being insurgents because we, there was no way of bringing these people back in because nobody trusted them. Because well, you're you're a, a Saddam supporter. You're a Muammar Gaddafi supporter. So it's not just as easy as let's overthrow the guy and let's have an election because. All the people who worked for the dictator for 40 years did a lot of bad things to a lot of people. And so it takes more than just cutting off the head of the snake to kill the snake because it's like a hydra where you have all these other problems that come up. And you have all these people who have been living under this, this situation for years. So again, Camp Gaddafi, he's trying to hold on to power and you have the people and they want freedom. But it's more than just about Gaddafi because they're upset with not only Gaddafi, if it was as simple as everything was fine once he's overthrown, it's not that simple. Because a lot of people had to, he didn't do all the killing himself. Okay? All right, now, I hope that you watch the news enough that you know what's going on in Syria. Syria is still in a civil war. Um, uh, Bashar al-Assad is still in power, and he uh, is backed by the Russians, and we in the United States have backed the um, Russian, or the, uh, not the Russian, but the, uh, the pro-revolution, um, the pro-freedom groups in Syria. The problem here is, is that there's been a war on terror since Gulf War II, right? Since we went into Afghanistan and we went into Iraq. So Vladimir Putin says, I can't stand terrorists, so we're going to bomb the terrorists in Syria. Well, to Bashar al-Assad, his terrorists are the revolutionaries, the people who want to overthrow him. So, now, the, now is, is Vladimir Putin trying to do the right thing? Absolutely not. The man used to work for KGB. So if you honestly think that he is like a good guy trying to do the right thing, that's not the case. Okay? He's using this as a way of, of political influence in the, in the region. Okay, but this is a hotbed of problems. Okay, protesters calling for the end of corruption, the action of poverty. This has been been an issue since the late '60s. It is a real problem. And again, the Syrian government claims that the protesters are terrorists and armed gangs, and they have got their big brother Russia giving them air support and guns. Okay, the U.S. and EU have imposed sanctions on Syria. But it doesn't matter how many sanctions they put on them. If Russia's willing to pay for their goods and give them money and support, sanctions don't do any good. Sanctions only work when everybody agrees to them. Okay? They're currently in civil war. He did gas his own people. And again, that's why international politics are hard. You know, during the Obama administration, the problem is he drew a red line. If you use chemical weapons, we're going to do something. And he used them. And he didn't go in. I'm not saying he should have gone in. The problem is when you draw a red line and somebody steps over it, it kind of makes you, you know, look powerless. Now, could we have done something? Yes, we could have. Would that have led to a greater conflict with Russia? Who knows? And so I'm not saying he made the wrong decision. But maybe he shouldn't have drawn the line to start with. It wouldn't have saved the people either way. Okay? Global politics are... If you think local politics are hard... We can't get people in the United States to agree. Global politics are even harder, okay? Because you're dealing with people who don't play by the same rules that we as Americans agree to. So again, all this is is there have been many promises of reforms uh, from Assad. They're all lies. He no more wants to leave power than any other dictator. Why does he want to stay in power? Because as long as he's in power... He, one, can't be held accountable for the bad things that he's doing. And two, he's making money. Nine times out of ten, when a dictator is overthrown, they have billions of dollars in the bank that they have taken from their people. Okay? Through the government. Graft. Corruption. 
And they know the day that they're out of power, the day that they say, I'm not going to run for president anymore, is the day all that goes away. He's never going to go away unless he is forced out by his own people. Okay? Again, they are enemies with Israel. They support Hezbollah, which has been a group that has, for years, sent mortars into Israel, bombed Israel, the northern section of Israel, the Golan Heights. And so again, it's a big problem because it's a powder keg. It could cause World War III. That's why nobody wants to do anything directly about it. And the people, the bad part about that is the people on the ground suffer, and they continue to suffer. Okay? So, <clears throat> this political uh, cartoon I like a lot because you do have Assad, and he's sitting here, and he's got two ways to go. He's kind of on the cusp of going either way. He could be more like Muammar Gaddafi, and who knows how long it's going to take him to get down this road, but it's going to end badly. Okay? Or he could go the way of Mubarak and try to reform things and give up power, and there's going to be freedom, which is going to end up badly for him too. It may not be as badly as it would over there. Either way, he's got to give up power, either by force or by election, and people being very upset with him. So he's kind of just saying, well, I'm just going to just sit here and wait, not make a decision. Okay? He's sweating it out. Algeria. So, again, it's kind of the same story. We could go through this. Um, there have been strikes and protests, pressure to change the Constitution, to allow private radio, and uh, to have televisions that are not sanctioned. Okay? Again, it's all about control. All about control. Um, he's promised reforms. It just never comes about. Okay? It never comes about. So he's been, he's been under pressure to change things. There have been, again, protests. There's been unrest. Um, he actually promised to amend the Constitution to strengthen the economy, uh, the democracy. The country state of emergency was lifted after, uh, in February after 19 years. In September, he announced that he was sweeping reforms of media, which would allow for private radio for the first time in four decades. Remember, this guy's been president for 40 years. Why don't they want private radio? Why don't they want private TV? Exactly, because they don't put it like a Fox News that says the president's bad. Or a CNN that says the president's bad, because all that matters is who's in power. If it's a Republican, then Fox News is going to say, yeah, the president's doing a pretty good job. If it's a Democrat, Fox News is going to say the president's doing a terrible job. CNN, they're going to say it's a Republican. The president's doing a terrible job. It just is what it is, Okay. So, but in countries like this, there is news, but it's government news. The president today did all kinds of awesome stuff, just like he has for the last 40 years. Because we all love the president. It's not true, but that's what's going to be on. That's why they want free public radio and TV. Okay? Again, it's another political cartoon. You have Tunisia, Libya going the same way. Are they going to buck him off? Throw him from... You have Morocco. Now, Morocco is interesting. <clears throat> Morocco is a kingdomship. It is a monarchy. Okay, uh, He's been in power since 99. <clears throat> Morocco is fa facing an economic crisis. And it's interesting because Morocco for years has been the place where people want to be a citizen because they have like very, 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 very low taxes. So if you're a billionaire in Europe, you want to be Moroccan. Like you move your stuff to Morocco. You become a resident of Morocco. You take advantage of their tax situation so you don't have to pay the taxes. Problem is, is you have a lot of wealthy people walking around with lots of money, but they're not paying into the public works and the education to help the country be better. They're just rich people spending money in your country, but not 
helping out your country in the public works. You have ultra rich and stupid uber poor. And the gap is huge. So, huge economic crisis there. The protesters want a symbolic monarchy and want a symbolic monarchy and the king's authority limited. They want real change. They want tax reform. They want a government that will actually tax some of these wealthy people so it brings about some broader wealth. Now, again, <clears throat> politically, I am kind of middle of the road. Taxes are not all bad, but nobody wants to pay them. I don't want to pay more taxes. That doesn't make me a complete, you know, right winger and, you know, that kind of thing. But I just wanted to be fair. A fair amount of tax, you know, and I want to make sure that our government works properly and spends that tax money well, okay? Same thing here. They want people to pay taxes to help the country, but then I saw this news report the other day, and it talked about the happiest place in the world is Denmark. Did you see that one? And they pay like... 85% taxes. Okay. And the government provides everything. I just don't think that works. Because there's no incentive for me to work really, really hard. They're going to take 85% of my stuff. You know? It works on a small scale. Obviously, it's working there. But the idea of it working on a country like the United States... Large country, it just doesn't work. So there's got to be a balance to it. Okay? So there was re uh, reforms that were passed in the referendum of July. Uh, one, 98% voted in favor. According to the ruling authorities, the changes reduced the king's wide-ranging power, which were previously had a free hand and selected the prime minister in, under the new constitution. He had to nominate someone from the largest party in parliament. So again, it's not a direct vote, but let's say your party wins, then I, as the king, have to pick somebody in your party. I still have some control over it because I'm mean, like, okay, you're the winning party. You're going to kind of do my thing. Okay, cool. I'll pick you. All right? Instead of you getting voted on by the people. Or being voted on by your party. In a normal parliament system, the prime minister is elected by the party that's in power. So let's use the Republicans and Democrats. Right now, if we were a parliamentary system, we had a prime minister instead of a, instead of a president, the Republicans, because they're in control of both House and Senate, would then vote for a prime minister, and that prime minister would be like the president. The king gets to pick the prime minister here based on what party's in control. Many protesters wanted a full constitutional monarchy with powers transferred from the king to the new constitution. Um, so they, even though, you, and that's the thing about reform, they say this about kids. You give an inch, they what? They take a mile. Well, in reform, unfortunately, it's a slippery slope, and it's not a bad thing because reform is good. You want things to change. You want things to get better. But the problem is, is once you start change, people say, it's not enough. That's nice. The king can't just pick who he wants. He has to pick from the party, but we don't want him to pick at all. I had a situation this year, even in inside the, the school district that I work for. We had a system in place, and one school was having to pick up all the slack. They, they had to give all the support. This year, they said, you know, you're not going to pick up all the support. You have to take care of one day, and the other two elementary schools are going to pick up the other day. So that's half of what you cover. There's two days a week that you've got to cover. I'm going to take and I'm going to take one of them away. You know what the school said? Well, we want somebody to help us with this day. You have half the amount of work. But that's reform. You give an inch. They want more. Okay? I promise you. And I want the tax reform to go through. Because who doesn't want to pay less taxes? I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat. I think I want to pay less taxes, right? I promise you, no matter what happens, it won't be enough. The tax cut will not be enough. I do want you to do some homework, though. Have any of you seen the uh, Sarah Huckabee thing on the taxes? All right, so you two, tonight, 
Okay? I'm going to ask you about it. YouTube tonight, I want you to watch it. Sarah Huckabee on tax reform. You know, she's the lady who is, who's the Secretary of Communication, Communication Secretary. Gets out and speaks in front of everybody on, on behalf of the administration. And she talked about what the tax reform would be like. Okay, the changes. And it deals with people going to a bar and paying their tab. Ten people. Okay? So you'll know if you're watching the right one if she's talking about paying for the bar tab. Okay? But you got to watch tonight. Okay? Okay. It's really good. Anyway. Again, it's another... Another political thing, one falls and falls for the same reason, and they just, you know, all of them are worried that the same thing's going to happen to them. Okay? Iran, we've talked about Iran. Again, you have Mahmoudinejad. He, is, he has been president. Now you have a new president. None of that matters because the security forces and everything are all controlled by the church, the mullahs. Okay, so the president is really more of a figurehead. Um, there have been lots of, of issues there. They've had revolts. They've had, you know, student uprisings. And, and, and the United States would love for them to overthrow, but we can't go in there because of what happened in 79 and the overthrow of the Shah, so we kind of leave it alone. Okay, but again, it's the same thing. They want to have more control and more say. And so we were hoping, lots of people were hoping this was going to overthrow Bahrain is the same thing, and I go through all of it because, I mean, again, it's kind of like when I talked about Africa. I taught a, 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 a class on African nationalism, same thing I taught in, in Latin America, okay? Corruption, poverty, there's not enough, there's not enough, there's not surplus. And when there's not surplus, there's revolution. There's revolt because people are unhappy with their station in life. Okay, so I mean, this is just a theme over and over and over again. Okay, again, the only caveat is this right here. We like having friends in the Middle East. Why? Because of oil. Especially when OPEC gets together and they're going to vote and they're going to pick how much we're going to sell oil for. It's good to have a couple of people at the table. So, do we want this guy overthrown if he's our ally? Why not? We love democracy. Not democracy here, but there, we can't control democracy there. That's just reality. Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia's not been overthrown. It's pretty stable. But again, the Saudis are under huge pressure to change because they could. They have. They have stupid wealth, like golden toilets wealth. Okay. That's the kind of wealth that the Saudi family has. And so opposition movements are banned. There are no political parties in Saudi Arabia. I mean, if you stood up in Saudi Arabia and say, down with the monarchy, let's have a free election, you'd disappear. But the reason why things there don't get out of hand is because the standard of living there is pretty good. In the Middle East, compared to most of the other Middle Eastern countries, the standard of living in, in, in Saudi Arabia is pretty high in terms of plumbing, electricity, internet use, as long as it's been controlled, that you have it, cellular phones. I mean, the standard of living is pretty high. But again, there's still pressure there. There's still pressure. There are political prisoners. There are, they are, there are people who are held without trial because you said something bad about Saudi King or you want reform, okay? Um... The kingdom has seen no mass pro-democracy protests or opposition movements because they are banned. However, there are small demonstrations and people who try to speak out, and they sometimes do that outside of Saudi Arabia, from like Bahrain. Okay. Again, Saudi Arabia has been and Saudi Arabia is a pro-American ally, so we like the Saudis. We like the stability they bring, but it's hard to like them because they're not a democracy. But remember, just because you're not a democracy doesn't mean we can't like you. As long as you treat your people fairly good, it's okay. The problem is, is sometimes they don't. You say something ugly. You don't have freedom of speech there. No freedom of religion there. Yemen's a mess. 
Yemen is an absolute mess. One, because they've had a dictator for 33 years. Okay? It's one of the poorest countries in the Middle East, if not the world. Has very little actual wealth in terms of oil or things like that. And so eventually people start trying to overthrow the government because they're not happy. Okay? It's also been a hotbed of where uh, terrorists have been uh, um, grown, especially anti Saudi Arabian terrorists. Okay, Saudi Arabia has led some strikes in um, Yemen to try to put down some of the revolutionaries there because they fear that those revolutionaries will grow and push into Saudi Arabia. So it's just a mess, absolute mess. Again, what's the next step? How do you grow democracy out of a out of a country that doesn't understand democracy? Okay, Oman. Again, it's the same. It's this has actually the difference between Oman and Yemen is that Oman actually has some resources. Oman is kind of like a small Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, yeah, small Saudi Arabia, and so it's it's just like Yemen, except it has oil, okay? Um, again, Oman is liked by the United States. So they're like our dirty little secret. We're like, okay with Yemen. Even though the people are oppressed, and that's a hard thing. Yeah, so what happens now? Many of these countries have decided the type of girls they want now that their dictators have been kicked out. They should have a, should they have a democracy or a theocracy? And it's like a, it's like a, a, a scales, okay? Why do these people get overthrown? Every, every, you've watched all these, okay, we've gone through all of them. Why are all these leaders overthrown? What was the common thing? Corruption. Corruption. What else? And them having all the wealth. Okay, so corruption and wealth. And doing bad things to their people, just taking advantage of them. I mean, what do you think the moral compass was of Muammar Gaddafi? Good guy, bad guy, horrible guy? Uh, horrible. Probably horrible. Pretty bad moral compass, right? So most of these leaders, compared to the people that, they, that they're in control of, most of the people would say, these are bad people. Most of them would say they're not good Muslims, right? Now... No matter what you do in your life, you will realize that life is all about the pendulum. You ever heard of the pendulum effect? You might know what a pendulum is. Like the yeah. yeah. Kind of between what you said and what he did. Yeah. Okay? So the pendulum basically works like this. You have a center point, and you have something that attaches here, and it hangs down. Okay? And everything in life comes between here. Typically, it's something like a metal ball or whatnot, and it swings back and forth, back and forth. Educational reform, political parties, political reform, taxes, anything, everything, okay? What's acceptable and what's not. So the problem here is, is that every time that something starts to occur, occur it goes to one side or the other, and it always reaches, it always reaches an apex, the highest point, okay? And then once something reaches its highest point, people start to not like it anymore. They have a problem with it. So it starts to swing back the opposite way, away from that highest point, okay? So if you think of politically, these people are not good Muslims, and they have complete control. So they start swinging this way. Well, complete control down to the middle would be democracy, right? Democracy, but freedom to act how you want. But if you go past this point, you start headed toward what? Well, it's up here. What's a theocracy? You answered that on a question. Theocracy is somebody, or it has like one person. Well, but who's the one person, or what's the one group that's in control? What's theocracy mean? Religious, Religious. Yeah. exactly. So the bad Muslim. Let's have a a government that's run by Islamic extremists that takes Islam to the extreme. Again, religious ideas. 
down the center of Christianity, all the way over here, KKK. Okay? All the way over here, no religion whatsoever. Islam, right down the middle. Islam extremism. No religion. I mean, so everything has the pendulum effect. When things get so out of control, people are doing whatever they want. People are like, you know what? We need some morality. And they start swinging back toward religion. Okay? So everything has this pendulum effect. So the problem here in the Arab Spring is that you have these countries that are coming out of complete and utter control by a very small group, but the control is very corrupt, super dis, uh, um, super difference between the wealthy and the poor, and they're morally bankrupt. So the idea is either we have a democracy which will be good for the people, or we have a theocracy because we need some people that are very moral in charge, because the people who were in charge were not. Many Islamic fundamentalists have gained lots of power and influence because these uh, uh, countries were supported by Western countries and are worried the secular democracies will be difficult to maintain. The idea is, is that it's easier if this is politically all the controls by this one person, but he's morally bankrupt. What we like is that this was stable. What we don't like is that this person was not fair. So they think, we'll skip this piece, we'll all the way over here because this is very hard to maintain. So think of the United States politically, you're trying to stay like right here. As long as you're doing this, it's not a problem. You're a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, but pretty much in the middle. They call it the third way. Okay? The problem is, is when you start to get way out of here, too liberal, well, too conservative. Right now, I would say that our country looks like this. It's getting wider and wider every day. Because I'm, people like me, okay? Now, I have no problem telling this to anybody. People like me are becoming very rare. I will vote either way. I want compromise. I want them to do what's right or do what's best for the most. But too often we have too many people that say, well, you're a Republican, so because you're a Republican, I don't care how good your idea is, I'm a Democrat, I can't vote for it. That makes no sense. Okay? Or vice versa. You're a Democrat, and you have this great idea to fix, fix health care, and I'm a Republican. Stinks for you, I can't vote for your bill. Not because I think it's great. Maybe you can get your Republican buddy to put up the same bill, and I'll vote for his bill. And it's word for word the same thing. That's where we are as a country right now, is that we've gotten so far, and I worry. I think if we ever get out here, if we ever get out here, we'll have our own spring. It'll be a third party. You have a third party because people will get so fed up with Republicans and the Democrats that somebody will have a third party that actually gets big enough to, to actually win the election. I hope not, because that's going to create instability. But, again, the problem is, is that people think... I like the stability of 30 years of rule because I kind of understood things. We didn't have to worry about just whoever's the biggest in the room can take control. But I just don't want the guy in control to be like Muammar Gaddafi or any of the others that are morally bankrupt. So maybe if we put the church in control, they'll keep people in line, but they'll do what's fair. The problem with that is that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You ever heard that? It's a famous saying. Power absolute power corrupts. The more power any one person has, the more they understand. They start drinking their own Kool-Aid. And I'm the most powerful man in the room. That's huge. I have ultimate control. And as soon as I really think that I have ultimate control, that's when I start making really bad mistakes. Like I can do whatever I want. I can take who I want. I can take their stuff. I can take their 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 kids. I can kill anybody I want, and it starts falling apart. Okay, well that's what's happening. So the idea that just because they are just because they are religious that they're going to do the right thing, not the case. And a lot of bad things have been done in the guise of religion. 
all religions, okay? Not just Islam. Not a bad meaning. Yeah, crusades. We talked about that. Okay? And again, democracies are difficult. Secular democracies are difficult. Why would it be easier to why would it be easier to have a government control by by religion? We all believe about the same thing, right? So if at least we believe the same thing, then coming up with the same ideas will be easier. When it's secular, we and they all believe different things. And we get to do it four different ideas instead of one. Okay? Alright, so again, this political cartoon, I love it because it's interchangeable. Ocracy just means rule by. You take off the top. The Arab Spring took off the top. Autocracy, meaning one control, authoritarian. Okay? So you got two choices a theocracy or a democracy. Okay? Which, which will it be? All right, continue, uh, consider the similarities between the countries. Again, what were the similarities? What's the overall condition of the vast majority of people in these countries? They are what? They're all poor. Poor. Extremely poor. What is the similarity between all of the governments? They're all rich. They're all rich, and they're controlled by one person for many years. There's not reform. There's not... Oh, yeah, they have elections. Okay. Is there any political freedom? No. Okay. What did most of the protesters want to accomplish? What did, they, what did most of them want? In all the countries we talked about in the PowerPoint, what do they all want? They want political freedom and what else they want? More wealth. They want more wealth. They want more food or they want lower costs. They want the economy to change. They, they want political freedom and they want financial freedom. They want the two things that they think will change their standard of living, period. Okay? The reason why this doesn't take hold in Saudi Arabia is because the standard of living in Saudi Arabia is better than Yemen. It's better than Iran. It's better than Iraq. It's better than in Egypt. So we say, yeah, you know, I'd love to be able to say what I want to say, but you know, life's pretty good. You know, free health care. Free school. I mean, life in Saudi Arabia although not free, is cushy compared to the rest of the Middle East. So the decision to overthrow that becomes very hard. Because when you look around and you look at your buddies and you go, yeah, so it's great. In Libya, you can say what you want to say. And you're dirt poor. And people are getting killed left and right because nobody's in control. Do you want that? Or do you want to live in Saudi Arabia? Okay? So you, you see the similarities in the countries is they all want the same thing, but you see where there has been most of the change are in countries where the standard of living is very low. And what rights are they fighting for? And do you have these rights? Obviously, we've talked about it. You do. In the United States, when you become 18, you get to vote. And basically, <clears throat> when you become 18, you get all the rights that the Constitution allows. Up until you're 18, you really don't have all those rights. You're technically under your parents, and in school, there are limitations to what you can say. I mean, you're a high school student, so in understanding that, you know that when you're on campus, there's only certain things that you can demonstrate and do and say. You can't wear certain shirts, things like that. But then once you become 18, you get out in the real world, you get in college, those things start to change. You can say more and do more. That's freedom of speech. Your freedom of speech in, in school is only limited by the fact that you can't cause an uprising. Okay? Right now, if you were to wear, say, a Black Lives Matter shirt to school, they're probably going to say, you can't wear that school because of the problems that it can occur. Not that you can't have a political statement. You can wear it on Saturday. You walk around all times when you wear it. You can't wear school. Are we, are we limiting your uh, freedom of speech? Yes. Because there's a certain level of, of our our responsibility to keep things safe and not be distracted. You can't color your hair any way you want in, in school systems. You can't come with just, you know, you can you color blonde, no problem. You can't color pink. Okay? And that sometimes causes us problems. 
because it's freedom of expression. But again, it's supposed to be not disruptive in any way, shape, or form. But once you become 18 in our country, you have all these rights. You have them so much that you don't use them. How old are you? 19. 19, how old are you? 20. 20. Did you vote? Mm-hmm. Every time? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Have you voted? Are you 18 yet? No. All right, you're going to vote I tomorrow? Just, I just voted tomorrow. 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 Yeah, I tomorrow. Know. No, I didn't know about it. You should go vote. And I'll tell you why, because you realize. <laughs> you realize, and, and the vote, election tomorrow uh, is, there's local elections, the city council, things like that. Um, you realize that the presidency, president is the single most powerful person in the world, right? That's, that's not a joke. He is. Whether it's Barack Obama, President Trump, doesn't matter. Most powerful person in the world. You realize that less than half of the people in the United States who can vote do vote. And then half of that group elects somebody. So the president is usually, even in a high voting year, usually elected by a quarter of the population of our country. Not half of our country, a quarter of our country. And the people in there spring these countries, the people there would kill, they literally have, to have the right to vote. And yet half of our country chooses not to. Oh, granted, that is a right of yours to choose not to. But I don't understand anybody who would choose not to. Because here's the thing. When people don't vote, that's one thing. But do they stop complaining? Absolutely not. My thing is, if you want to complain you don't like President Trump, great, that's fine. Did you vote? If you voted and you voted for Hillary, or you voted for uh, you know, an independent, and you didn't go your way, fine. You get to complain all you want because you were part of the political process. But anyone who comes to me and says, I can't stand Donald Trump, da 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 and I say, hey, did you vote? Well, no, I don't ever vote. I'm not listening to you. You're not even part of the process. Go back eight years. Same thing with Barack Obama. I can't stand Barack Obama. He's a Muslim. No, he's not. But okay, you just don't like Barack Obama. I've heard that a thousand times, right? Well, did you vote? No, I didn't vote. I don't ever vote. I, I'm not talking to you either. <laughs> it's a precious right that we take for granted in the, in the United States. I have not missed an election in my entire life since the day I turned 18. Now, part of that is because my mom, she was in politics, like she did campaigns and stuff. So she, all of me, she stressed, that's your right, you gotta vote. And now, being a grown man, it's, I just feel that way. Like, I'm gonna make sure my kids vote. Because it is a, it is, it is a right that we take for granted. It is the number one thing that the Arab Spring was trying to get was political freedom. And it makes me feel good that you guys vote. I know you will, you know, but, it makes me feel good that you're actually aware of it. Because most people don't, and it's sad. Absolutely sad. Social media, these are the things that they were trying to, you know. Again, the air springs made worse by Yeah, the air springs made worse by social media. Facebook has blown up reform and revolution. Because it, is, it moves faster than any government can, can move. Okay? Look at the weapons that the protesters have. Facebook and Twitter. But it's true, though. The rule of technology. Y'all need to check out those videos because it, it's really profound. It, it shows how... In this day and age, in 1989, you had Tiananmen Square, which was a revolution that tried to take hold in China. It that was a failure. They rolled over people with, with tanks and stuff. It was horrible. If it had occurred, but since then, China's put in a lot of reforms to try to like raise people's standard of living. China is still a, a communist country, but the one thing they got right was they they raised the standard of living for a lot of people in their country. And so people are like, well, at least it's better than the standard of living in India. At least it's better than the standard of living in 
North Korea. Okay, so they're not willing to overthrow it because it's better than it's ever been. But in '89, it was not good. It was really not good. They were they were very poor. They did not they didn't have the plans that they have now, where they're trying to make their own economy feed on itself and be self sufficient and and dominate the world economy. I mean, it, in in the late '80s, it was in rough shape. But in the '80s, it was no Facebook. It was barely an internet. If that had happened now in China was the same state it was in the 80s now you probably would have a, a different China that's how powerful Facebook and Twitter has been I mean I can't stress it enough it has been absolutely game-changing and it's also become very very popular it's got a lot of press <laughs> The downside to the Arab Spring. Anybody know this gas prices of the last five years? Higher than they've ever been. A lot of that's due to the Arab Spring. Democracy is expensive. Okay. So, that's all I have for tonight. We will meet next week.